We're just doing some takes. <clears throat> the U.S. military is trying to act like a self-help program, and I'm not buying it. Well, I guess I'm going through with this. Hi there, this is a channel where I make fun of marketing, and today's video is about a very special kind of marketing. If you think about marketing or, or advertising in general, whatever comes to mind probably has something to do with the promotion of a product or a service. But in contrast, military marketing is not trying to sell you a product or a service at all. Its primary function is basically job recruitment and job recruitment advertising just isn't that common in general. Based on my personal experience, military recruiting ads absolutely dominate this relatively niche category of job recruitment advertising, especially in recent months. Over the last year or so, I have seen a really notable increase in the number of US military recruitment ads, specifically on Reddit. It does not matter which subreddit I'm looking at or, or even whether I'm signed in to the site or not, I have been presented with so many of these ads. Here are just a few of them that I've screenshotted while browsing. In a moment, I'll be getting into some educated guesses as to why these ads seem to have become more common. But before any of that, I need to make my intentions for this video very clear. If you don't really care about that part, if you don't feel the need for clarification, go ahead and skip ahead. I'll try to do time codes and stuff like that. I'm a little bit worried that because this video involves the US military in any way that some viewers might assume <laughs> I'm here to talk about like US military policy or to like go after soldiers for I don't know like being in the military at all and neither of those is the case. I'm going to be touching on the state of military recruiting for obvious reasons, and there's plenty of research in here about the effects of military service, but this is ultimately about the ethics and accuracy of military advertising. Hi, Cap. Do you want to stay right there? I have never served in the military, and I, I don't plan to anytime soon, but many of us here in the U.S. have, have some sort of connection to military service. Both of my granddads served and, and one of them was actually stationed at Pearl Harbor during Pearl Harbor. So you can bet that he had some pretty great stories to tell. Uh, I also grew up in an area where enlisting was seen as incredibly positive. So I definitely knew plenty of people who joined. So I am, I'm really not trying to criticize anyone for joining and I'm not trying to discourage anyone from joining. I have my thoughts and feelings about it, but it's just not my place <laughs> to do that. If anything, I think that my research for this project has given me just a renewed sense of sympathy and in some cases concern for service members, like just the things that they have to put up with both while deployed and after returning home are challenging to say the least. I'm hoping this video can serve as, as some kind of resource for people considering enlistment and for everyone else, I, I hope that it sheds some kind of light on the realities of, of how service can shape someone's life. And surprise, I, I don't think that recruiting ads or even like recruitment websites communicate those realities effectively or even at all. Okay, let's talk about the state of U.S. military recruiting. You might want to kick your shoes off. This is going to... We're going to be here a while. Oh, a helicopter. No. Private. Not LAPD. I think it's just a private helicopter. To begin, a brief summary of where the U.S. military stands right now, specifically in terms of recruiting. Uh, so 2023 was the 50th anniversary of the switch to an all-volunteer system. So in other words, 50 years ago, military drafting was, was stopped, or more accurately, paused. They always leave the option open. But even during the, the so-called War on Terror, uh, the military was still volunteer only. You, you had to choose to serve. 
No one was being forced into it. Well, at least not on paper, I guess. There are obviously other forces at work that encourage or discourage a person to join the military. But this 50th anniversary of no draft also coincided with negative recruitment watersheds, at least for certain branches of the military. So this article here provides a good breakdown of changes in recruitment. In 2023, the Navy, Army, and Air Force all missed their recruitment targets, with the Army in particular only hitting about 77% of their recruitment goals. Also, the overall number of active duty members of the military across all branches has been declining rather steadily for decades now, from the end of the Vietnam War onward more or less. Now, the reasons for lackluster military recruiting are complex, and I'm never going to be able to cover every single contributing factor, but I do want to talk about a handful of factors that I came across during my research. So for one, according to this Gallup poll conducted back in 2023, uh, the percentage of Americans who have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the military is at a 20-year low, hovering around 60% with clear divisions based on political party association. Uh, this NBC article from 2022 also does a pretty good job of summarizing different factors. Apparently, many otherwise eligible individuals, more than ever before, are technically ineligible for military recruitment due to having criminal records, uh, a history of drug use, or obesity. Also, the vast majority of people who would be eligible to serve just really don't want to. <laughs> According to a survey conducted by the Defense Department, 9% of those surveyed said that they would actually join. <laughs> and I'm just going to read this next part verbatim from the article because it's going to come up again later. More than half of the young Americans who answered the survey, about 57%, think they would have emotional or psychological problems after serving in the military. Nearly half think they would have physical problems. Can't imagine where they would get that impression. I'm, I'm sure it's completely baseless. They think they're going to be physically or emotionally broken after serving, said one senior U.S. military official familiar with the recruiting issues, who believes a lack of familiarity with military service contributes to that perception. Another factor for recruitment is unemployment rates nationwide. According to the Department of Defense's 11th Quadrennial Review of Military Compensation, what a title, which is actually an excellent read, by the way, it's very interesting. Uh, low unemployment rates generally result in decreases of high quality enlisted recruiting. So with that in mind, at the time of writing anyway, the U.S. unemployment rate is, I think, about 3.7%, which is incredibly close to pre-pandemic lows, actually, so it's pretty good news. So overall, Americans seem to be losing faith in the military. Fewer Americans are eligible for military service due to various health and, and behavioral factors. Fewer eligible Americans have any kind of interest in joining the military, and major branches of the military are missing their recruiting targets. In fact, just one branch of the military has had a surplus of applicants. Take a moment to guess. Space Force. You forgot about Space Force, didn't you? Shame on you. But apparently they're not having such severe recruiting issues. Though I should also note that this is the smallest military branch by far. And in 2023, their total recruiting target was 472. So to sum up, the US military is experiencing some very serious recruiting issues. The US military's advertising attempts to close the recruiting gap are fascinating to me. So let's talk about the ads. I promise this won't take very long, but I would like to briefly show you some vintage ads from the US military to highlight how their advertising approaches have changed. One of the most noticeable changes between the ads of the late 70s and the 80s up to the 9-11 era ads and the ads being released today is the overall tone. So let's do a quick taste test. Try some of this. And now, try this. Hey, first sergeant. 
Good morning. You can do it. I feel like I just crossed the street from the salty spittoon to Weenie Hut Juniors. Like, and, and a sort of shocking part of that jolly tone of the older ads is the amount of smiling going on. Like this shot genuinely looks like something from a Folgers coffee ad. And the smiling gets a bit stranger in this other ad, which I believe is from the same campaign, Be All You Can Be, which has subsequently been revived as a marketing tagline for the army two separate times, as far as I can tell. And it's a phrase we'll definitely be returning to. This ad does show combat in comparison to the Folgers ad, uh, albeit tank combat. You know, it's not just people on the ground. This serves multiple functions, come to think of it. So technology is a focal point of this ad. No specifics, really. They're not trying to explain any of the technology. It's just a general message of, look, we've got super advanced tech that is also fun to use, I guess. This team uses a computer, thermal sight, laser rangefinder. But tank combat also lets them show fighting, <laughs> conflict, without making the audience think too much about the fact that we have probably just seen people die, or, or, or rather we've seen implied deaths. In fact, here is how they portray the kill itself. Ah! Yeah. Is it irresponsible and potentially harmful to portray warfare as lighthearted fun? Playtime is over when Nikki drops in. Yeah, yes, it, it probably is. But if I put myself in the very sweaty shoes of the creatives working behind these ads, I can kind of understand the decision. So it's the post-Vietnam era, and you're trying to make people want to join the military of their own accord, focusing on the horrors of murdering other people to advance the geopolitical, ideological, and financial interests of your country probably isn't going to bring a lot of people in. Or if it does, it'll be the wrong kind of people, the, the, the kind of people who just love killing. I, I get that decision. You, you catch more GIs with honey than with vinegar. But there's a more substantial change that's taken place between the ads of the 80s and the ads of today. And it's a change that points to the realities of modern marketing as well as the U.S. military's relative desperation to attract people to an undeniably dangerous career. In essence, recruitment advertising has become less about we and more about I. In other words, recruitment ads are now focused much more on the individual, the role of the individual within a particular branch of the military, uh, the personalized aspects of military service, or just generally about how military service benefits you. Should I do like a Uncle Sam? You. He probably used his right hand, huh? You. you. It's out of focus. Even if the ads don't break the fourth wall and, and directly address the viewer, though many of them do, especially nowadays. I said I never joined. You can still tell that they're trying to appeal to each viewer's sense of individuality and their individual needs. This is probably most apparent in ads for the National Guard and various reserve forces. So this is an oversimplification, but joining a, a reserve force or, or branch of the military, it's kind of like part-time, at least for the time being, you're not being shipped off. You, you work from wherever you are on certain weekends, and then you engage in a couple weeks of training each year. In fact, the Air Force refers to reserve as part-time service. So there you go. So to lean into this concept of relative flexibility and personalization, ads for reserve service include a lot of variety, as well as recreational activities, apparently. In fact, this particular ad for the Air National Guard, originally released in 2022, but appearing on Reddit just about every day that I have visited for the past month, could easily be mistaken for an REI commercial, or at least portions of it, <laughs> especially given the choice of music, which is a track called Invincible by Topo Azul, which is indeed a licensable music library track. Also, check out, check out these mood tags for the song page. We have burdened, empowering, energetic, gritty, 
powerful cold. <laughs> so I'm just going to guess that our friends over at GSDNM, the agency responsible for this ad and who do a lot of work for the Air Force specifically, saw those tags and were just like, yeah, perfect. <laughs> like we, we expect members of the Air National Guard to feel burdened, but like in a cool way. <laughs> you're going to suffer. Mm -hmm but you're gonna be happy about it. The crux of what I'm trying to get at here is that contemporary US military recruiting ads are focusing on the individual, arguably more than ever before. Even as recently as 2001, we had this ad for the army, which prominently features group voiceover. First, from like collective members of the army, I guess. <laughs> and then from a vertical, like rotating slice of the American population who provide various bits of rhetoric affirming that serving in the army is a very, very, very good thing to do. Brave, 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 brave and, full and full courage. courage. Full of courage. You are a peacekeeper. You are the defender, defender of, of democracy. democracy. What I look up to. There's a huge amount of group sentiment in this ad, visually, audibly, and even just conceptually. And to this day, certain military ads do still focus on the appeal of belonging to a group or specifically belonging to an elite group, as is the case with a lot of Marines recruiting ads typified by their slogan, the few, the proud. Also, what were they thinking with this render? It looks like this man has some sort of terrible disease that causes like toy soldiers and model kits to just grow out of him. It's kind of a fun horror movie premise. So while group sentiment is indeed a component of contemporary military recruiting, it is accompanied by reinforcement of individualism, a focus on you and not we. Now, if that sounds like a contradiction, that's only because it is. Uh, this is where we need to step into the boardroom for a minute. Please have a seat. We just won a government contract. We're making ads for the US military. So put your ethical quibbles in your pocket and get thinking. Here's the situation. The military needs bodies, I mean people, but a lot of bodies, I mean Americans, especially the members of our target audience, think that being in the military is dangerous. Serving in the military requires a certain amount of teamwork and collective action. Kind of a lot, as it turns out. Problem is, many Americans greatly value their sense of individuality and independence. What do we do? How about we just ignore the collective action part and focus on how cool it is to fly super fast fighter jets and, and shoot big guns? Great idea. Write it down. What if we act like joining the military is all about self-improvement. Like a lot of people hate themselves. They end up buying into like life coach bull and, and condescending self-help programs. Meeting over, we're going with it. You take point on this one, Alana. I think the self-help comparison is very useful here because when you start to make claims about how doing such and such will improve someone's life, regardless of whether these claims are explicit or implicit, the real world outcomes are measurable. <laughs> like we, we can do research to determine whether or not those claims are actually true. Or in this case, I can do some research on my nights and weekends to, to make this video for you. So before jumping into the research, here are a few military recruitment ads that I feel include a heavy self-improvement angle of some kind. First, we have a whole set of army ads from an agency called Omnicom DDB, incredible name, uh, which is an enormous agency that has also done work for McDonald's, the UK National Lottery, gun reform, and this. Uh, okay, so these army ads bring back the, the be all you can be tagline, which was also brought back around 2001. Now, obviously this tagline on its own is very self-helpy. In fact, it is the title of a self-help book from 2007. As for the ads themselves, they're meant to loosely follow the trajectory of new recruits, which by the way, is mirrored by a short form documentary series from the Air Force titled Basic. So first arrival is probably the best of these three ads in terms of baseline filmmaking and just like capturing the feeling of being unsure about 
a big decision, but also kind of committed to it. So you get these little clips of each recruit at home. Uh, I think the set design and framing is is well done. They're, they're pretty good looking. Uh, this shot in particular is very important. Well over half of military vets under the age of 40 came from a military family. So this was definitely the, the previous norm and these direct familial connections to military service are still quite strong among new recruits. So while this norm can't be relied upon forever to, to generate sufficient recruitment numbers today, this little nod will no doubt speak to a lot of potential recruits who are already seriously considering joining. We also get some POV shots on the bus, which are typically used to heighten the viewer's sense of immersion, of course. The, the target audience is meant to relate to these characters, a goal that is also supported by the fact that none of these characters really speak. <laughs> they are audience inserts. They're just husks meant for you to inhabit so that you can form positive associations with the army as these husks advance through the early stages of their military service. Okay, so this spot, first arrival, is followed by first patch and first target. There might be some, these are all the ones I could find. Now, each individual ad contains its own sense of, of improvement and progress, but of course the whole campaign also represents improvement. You start out as just some person having breakfast, and in just a few months, you could be killing people. Sorry, I mean, eliminating targets. Hey! Nice shot. Yeah. Next up, we have an Air Force ad from 2017 titled Letter, in which General Dave uh, Goldfein, I'll go with that, reads a letter to his younger self, but of course it's, it's general enough to serve as effective messaging for potential recruits. It's pretty floaty language overall, but this line in particular is blatantly self-helpy. One day, you're gonna look up and be a better you. Another Air Force ad, this one from 2023, titled, This Is It, it borrows elements, let's say, from old Edgar Wright movies, the, the editing, and I guess also SpongeBob, I think you know which sequence I'm referring to. Basically, the ad shows our protagonist going through the motions of an unfulfilling work routine, but look at that. He joins the Air Force and he's, he's happy now. I think the self-improvement aspect speaks for itself here. Moving on to the Navy, we have an ad titled Strong Enough in which the characters, they talk for one thing, which is very exciting to see. The characters are talking about how joining helped them realize their full potential. Messaging that is confirmed by the copy in the video description of the YouTube upload, which reads, saying never to the Navy means never realizing your full potential. In addition to the self-help, self-improvement push of this ad, it also includes the other approach that we talked about back in the boardroom, cool stuff is cool. Look at this cool stuff. Don't you wanna do that? What else do we have here? A Marines ad titled Battle to Belong has an admittedly creative approach. It portrays a, a Blade Runner future of hyper consumerism and, and just adver crazy advertising, which of course it's ironic in itself, but we're moving on. Uh, and our main character here is strong enough, brave enough to like, shoulder check a hologram advertisement version of himself. Um, now, as you might suspect, I do love the, the anti-consumerism angle that's going on here. Unfortunately, when I ran this one through the analysis machine, it turned up some contradictions. So at heart, the messaging here is not that different from the messaging of this is it. it. It's supposed to be saying your life is sad and unfulfilling in not so many words. Therefore, you should join the military to give your life purpose. Side note, to be clear, when the military talks about members finding purpose, that, that typically means being handed a purpose by the military. So let's not act like it's, you know, it's a journey of self-discovery. If this is an ad for the Marines, and this is a Marines recruit, then isn't the future world that we see at the start of the ad America? Like, it's, it's meant to be civilian life in the US, right? So this ad has an inherently negative outlook on either the, the future US, the current US, or, or both. And that's an incredibly strange 
ingredient to include because what the military typically invokes when when discussing serving a greater purpose is the safeguarding of the United States. It's the whole freedom isn't free thing. You're you're fighting for the folks back home. The ad itself seems to be saying that civilian life in the U.S. is something to be escaped. This is an escapist recruitment ad, and that is not something I had ever considered before. I really doubt that that was the intention here, but I find the idea fascinating. Anyway, the self-improvement component to this one is basically identical to the other ads I just discussed. Unlock your potential, do more, be all you can be. So I hope that's enough to establish that self-improvement is indeed a common thread of modern U.S. military marketing. There's more, <laughs> there is more out there, but I need to keep this moving, especially because this next section is going to be a doozy. For better or worse, I decided to do some research to at least get a sense for how military service affects people. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not for me to make definitive statements about these effects, but at the very least, I can compare what I found to the intensely sunny image that advertisers working for the US government have drawn. Here are three specific areas I wanted to research. Job satisfaction to try to tackle the, the sense of purpose uh, angle of a lot of these ads, the financial well being of both service members and veterans, and health, obviously, including mental health. I decided to disregard like personal accounts and testimonies. I, I have no doubt that Reddit and YouTube comments and other social media sites are, are filled with both positive and negative uh, individual takes on each person's military experience. But I wanted to focus instead on data, just hard numbers from various reports about each of these aspects. Please be skeptical of my research. Feel free to do your own research. I just wanted to get an overview, both for myself and, and for the sake of the video. All right, another quick note on the research portion of this video. So this section was originally about like 30 minutes of an hour long video. So I have decided to condense these sections and try to do a better job of summarizing what I've found. I'm going to put quotes and, and charts and images on the screen when I feel that they're appropriate. And I will also have a complete list of sources for this entire video in the description. So if you want to read through the reports for yourself, which I highly recommend, by the way, they're, they're really interesting, most of them, you can do so fairly easily. Okay, I'm ready. Let's let's go ahead and do it. The first category is overall job satisfaction. Here are the specific sources that I referenced. We have the 2021 Military Family Lifestyle Survey Comprehensive Report conducted by Blue Star Families, which is an organization founded by military spouses. The next source is the Department of the Army Career Engagement Survey's first annual report. And we have the 2021 Active Duty Spouse Survey from the Department of Defense's Office of People Analytics. When it comes to the reasons why military service members are or are not satisfied with their current work, many of the most common reasons are similar between service members and civilians. Reasons like wanting greater job satisfaction, uh, wanting higher pay, uh, childcare challenges, and even just wanting a better work environment. However, overall, 67% of active duty service members say that they are satisfied with their job. And while lots of civilians don't feel a sense of purpose in their work, many service members, approximately 70%, feel that their work is meaningful. That said, women service members and service members of color were generally less positive about their current work and also less confident in leadership. A majority of service members appreciate having the opportunity to serve their country through their work, and, and they also appreciate, of course, their retirement pay, <laughs> the benefits they get, and also opportunities to further their education. Many of the most commonly cited negative aspects of military service and military careers are centered on how service affects their families and their personal relationships. 53% of those surveyed, however, said that they would recommend military service 
to somebody close to them. To briefly touch on how military spouses feel about service, results obtained back in 2021 suggest increasing negativity. Fewer spouses favor continued service, and for spouses of members of the Marine Corps in particular, only a minority of those surveyed actually wanted their spouse to continue to serve in active duty. So to sum up the job satisfaction category here, at least based on these sources, it appears that the assertion from numerous recruiting ads that military service can lead to fulfilling work is not at all without substance. Like clearly many members of the military really like their jobs. However, this definitely does not apply to all members of the military and it is especially questionable when it comes to women service members and service members of color. And further, many service members recognize the difficulties that their service poses to their family life or just their work-life balance in general, and military spouses are increasingly negative about military life and their partner's involvement in active duty. Financial well-being is up next. Here are the sources that I referenced for this section. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's report on the financial well-being of veterans from 2019, the Department of Defense's annual report on the financial literacy and preparedness of members of the armed forces, 2020, my gosh, that's hard to say in one breath, the National Veterans Technical Assistance Center's research roundup on the financial impact of military service, <laughs> which actually summarizes multiple research studies from around 2009 to I believe 2016. Gonna take a moment just to breathe. Man, these I don't think anyone in the world ever has to say those titles out loud. I might be the first person. It seems that many service members and veterans have financial well-being scores that are similar to, or even slightly better than, national averages. However, many of the contributing factors such as higher education, higher income, and home ownership are not directly tied to military service. Anybody who, who has those factors on their side will generally have a better financial standing. Unfortunately, service members are at greater risk regarding the management of mortgages and other kinds of debt. A survey of homeless veterans showed that various types of financial assistance were the most common unmet needs of these veterans. Active military service can also make managing financial accounts significantly more difficult. For example, if you're deployed somewhere, you might not have a lot of opportunities to just check your accounts or contact financial institutions. In a 2014 survey, 77% of the service members surveyed worried about finances, 55% said that they were not ready for a financial emergency, and 58% carried credit card debt from month to month, with the national average being just 34%. Financial issues also have potential connections to a number of different mental health issues too. Lastly, here is a direct quote I just had to include, and it's easily one of the most depressing things that I came across here. Service members are often the target of unscrupulous practices and predatory lenders who know that transitioning veterans and service members are an economically vulnerable population. For example, the largest concentrations of payday lending businesses are located in the same zip codes as military bases. Active duty service members may be as much as three times more likely to take payday loans than civilians. Just a reminder, payday lending consists of handing out incredibly short-term loans with interest rates upwards of 300%. It should be illegal. To summarize, financial well-being for a majority of service members at the very least and veterans is pretty darn good, at times better than that of their civilian counterparts. However, certain service members have very serious financial problems, which can also contribute to health problems and even homelessness. There are also scum-sucking bottom feeders not fit to wear human skin who are just waiting to prey on and exploit members of the U.S. military, and nobody's stopping them, least of all the U.S. government. The last category is health, which is especially difficult to summarize, partly because there are so many dimensions to human health and so many ways that health can be impacted during and after service. 
So of all of these, please don't take this as anywhere near definitive. It's just a, it's an overview of a few different sources that I found. The sources that I referenced for this portion are the Department of Defense's Statistics on Military Deaths, the Department of Defense's Defense Health Agency Report, of the mental health of the U.S. Armed Forces from 2016 to 2020, and a Costs of War research paper titled High Suicide Rates Among United States Service Members and Veterans of the Post-9-11 Wars. Yes, it's going to get very dark. While deaths among active duty service members are generally very low, just statistically speaking, we're talking about like far less than 1% of total membership across all branches. In, in 2021, for example, I think it was like 0.07%. The three most common causes of death since the 1980s are accidents, illness, and self-inflicted, a category that I would really love to have more details on, but it's just, I don't know. Mental health issues are quite common among service members. Here's a quote. During the five-year surveillance period, 456,293 active component service members were diagnosed with at least one mental health disorder. Now for context, according to that other chart, between 2016 and 2020, the total numbers of active duty service members hovered between like 1,288,000 and 1,387,000. So this is the equivalent of about one third of all service members who were diagnosed with at least one disorder over this five year period. The most common disorders were adjustment disorders, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and other mental health disorders, which is extremely unhelpful. And lastly, we have a quote from the Costs of War research paper that I mentioned. I'll just go ahead and read it out. Suicide rates among the United States public have been increasing for the past 20 years, but among active military personnel and veterans of the post 9-11 wars, the suicide rate is even higher, outpacing average Americans. This paper estimates 30,177 active duty personnel and veterans of the post 9-11 wars have died by suicide significantly more than the 7,057 service members killed in post 9-11 war operations. In the post 9-11 era, the rise of improvised explosive devices, the attendant rise in traumatic brain injuries, the war's protracted length, advances in medical treatment that keeps service members in the military longer, and the American public's disinterest in the post 9-11 wars have greatly contributed to increased suicide rates. If these estimates are correct, it would mean that over four times as many service members and veterans have died by suicide as those who were killed in the wars themselves. It's just appalling. I don't think I need to add any more comments there. To sum up, the ongoing health of military service members and veterans is subject to severe risk and danger comes in many different forms. Also, the effects of service can last for many years, potentially for the rest of your life. Wow, we made it. What I'd like to do now is play some clips from the recruitment ads that we looked at earlier. And at least for me, knowing what we know now, they take on a very different feel. I figured I'd never get out of my hometown. No one can ever take away what it means to be among the few. This is it! It's sort of a no-brainer for recruiting ads to focus very much on the sense of purpose concept. Even in my very cynical view, it has a very tangible basis. In reality, many service members do feel good about their service, that, that they are serving their country in some way. Now, whether or not they actually are doing good for the American people, as opposed to people in positions of power, is a separate discussion, but the data does suggest general satisfaction with the work. Of course, even on this point, we have to consider that you're more likely to feel satisfied with military service if you're white and male. If you're a person of color or if you're a woman, there is at least a higher chance that you will not feel as satisfied, uh, listened to, or, or recognized based on the, the BSF survey. For predictable reasons, recruitment ads just completely omit portrayals of the financial and the health realities of service. And it's an understandable choice, like from an advertising perspective, but we are still allowed to question whether or not these omissions 
result in misleading advertising. And I think they do. I, I think it's completely fair to want recruiting ads to be honest. I, I don't expect them to list out a bunch of stats. I don't expect them to show funerals, but when it's nothing but sunshine and rainbows, or also importantly, look how cool this stuff is, it starts to inch closer and closer to some form of propaganda. And yes, you're right, advertising is already corporate propaganda, but private ad agencies getting involved in actual government propaganda is, at the very least, a concerning possibility. Also, potentially misleading advertising is a massive concern when the target audience is younger people. 18 is the minimum age that we're talking about here for enlisting. I have heard so many people talk about how unethical it is to pressure 18 year old people into, you know, massive student loans that they're gonna be saddled with for, for decades. And that's true. <laughs> the, the human brain hasn't finished developing at that point. And there are all kinds of influences encouraging 18 year olds to, to go through with that without really considering the consequences. But when an 18 year old decides to join the military, it's just assumed that everyone's response is going to be positive. It's, it's like someone announcing a pregnancy. Your default response cannot be, oh no, I'm so sorry. Unless you have a close personal relationship with a new recruit or, or a potential recruit, you really can't tell them to reconsider. It's just not your place. And, and regardless of your relationship with this person, at a certain point, you also just have to respect their decision. I'm not telling anyone to join or not join the US military, but I do want to highlight just how much there is to consider here. In addition to the risks and the, the dangers of active duty, service is very likely to have a lasting effect on who you are as a person and your ability to manage different aspects of your life. And quite famously, despite the clear appreciation that the military shows for its members, ongoing support once you've returned to civilian life is inadequate at best. <laughs> like there, there are programs, but when veterans end up homeless or taking crippling payday loans or taking their own lives, it seems like very clear evidence that despite the value of your service, despite the sacrifices you've made, the US government support post-service is largely performative. As for the advertisers, I don't know, man, like you guys willingly took US government contracts. You're at least partially complicit in what happens to recruits. And as a sign of my respect for the brave ad agencies making taxpayer funded recruitment ads, uh, I would like to offer a brand new mascot that you can use in any of your work. Here he is on the screen. This is Lucky Larry. And you'd better bet that as soon as he turned 18, he signed up for service. He didn't know too much about what it actually involved, but he was sure that things would probably work out. And they have, mostly. I don't claim any rights to Larry. I'm, I'm giving him away. Use him. I did it for you to nudge you in the general direction of honest advertising. That's the end of the video proper. I, I can't thank you enough for making it this far, especially if you sat through all the research sections. I felt this was something worth talking about and, and I hope I did a decent job of saying my piece. At the same time, I am very excited to move on. This was incredibly depressing, but otherwise this brings the video to a close. Thank you again. Um, I'll be back as soon as I can. Take it easy.